happy to see that video. Uh, so I'll keep it short today on introduction because we have two great women explaining to us uh, high performance windows and doors for Passive House projects. So I would like to uh, welcome Ilka Cassidy, co-host of the Passive House podcast and co-founder at of Hulls Rome Systems, and to Shannon Pendleton, owner of Sanderson Sustainability Design, Passive House Consultant at Source 2050, and Passive House Accelerator Live Construction Tech co-host. Uh, like I said, I'll keep it short, so I'll just uh, pass it along to them. They have a really interesting presentation and a nice surprise at the end for all of you who want to uh, see more of the numbers on the windows and doors. Great job introducing us, but Elka, if you want to say a little bit more, uh, feel free. Well, maybe um, I guess we both have been around in the Passive House community for quite some time, I think. So I think I, I took my Passive House class in about 10 years ago or so. So since then, I've done uh, a lot of energy modeling and looking at windows in, in different ways through projects on, on paper, in numbers. So I think that's something that I would like to share today. Perfect. Uh, and for those of us, uh, for those of you who don't know Elka and I yet, um, feel free to connect with us anytime. And keep in mind that we met while we were volunteering. Uh, we were both around the Philadelphia area. And we volunteered with a group called Green Building United, started their passive house group there when there wasn't one. And it's a great way to meet like-minded folks like you do when you're here at the Accelerator and do things in person and start working on projects. So uh, when we met Elka, I don't think either of us had done a passive house yet. We were both certified, but we were looking for that perfect first client and uh Ended up working on the project you see behind both of us today, which gave us a good lesson in windows and doors. So we're ready to share it. So I'm going to get started and share my screen. Give me a thumbs up when you see it. Awesome. And welcome everyone uh, to today's Passive House Accelerator Live 101 Windows and Doors event. We are really happy to be here and help you get worried. <laughs> so why worry? Why worry about windows and doors? Well, there are many reasons. And I think the biggest one is that our homes are the biggest investment that most of us will make in our lifetime. And what are the biggest ticket items in each one of those buildings? Foundation roof, and yes, windows and doors. So beyond being a big ticket item off the shelf, they have to get installed in the building. And even the best window can fail on install. So we want you to worry about your windows and doors through three lenses today. One is selection, the other is installation, and the third is optimization. So previous to passive house levels of performance, the way we built left a lot to be desired and yielded very uncomfortable, drafty, uh, inefficient energy hog buildings that often uh, came with a little bit of moisture around the windows. So now we know better. And in a passive house, high performance windows and doors are so important that they have a category all their own as one of the five core principles. And I was going to explain these, but I think the video did a great job um, getting started. And you can always go to PassiveHouseAccelerator.com for a briefing on these five principles. But because Passive House is a whole building systems approach, each principle impacts all of the others. And in large part, windows and doors determine the ultimate levels of performance that we can achieve in our buildings. So an investment in those and the proper installation of those will deliver those immediate benefits, like being more durable, being far more comfortable, more quiet, and condensation free. So think about the, the passive house principles as levers, that when you pull on one, the others move and respond in real time or as connected seesaws, that when you optimize them, they work in balance with each other. 
But beyond the returns on our investment and our comfort, when we balance everything, why else should we worry about windows and doors? Well, for the same reason that we care about operational energy and embodied carbon, because 42% of the energy that our U.S. buildings use, 58% of that energy is directly impacted by windows. So that's more than half of the energy used in our buildings. And those poorly performing windows and doors are throwing our buildings, our wallets, and our climate out of balance. This is a great example of that balance from uh, Passive House Accelerator's 101 Crash Course by Zach Semke and Michael Ingui, showing the window performance and insulation levels of the exterior walls. And what you can see in the middle of each of these images in that bar chart is what we call the effective R value, which is the sum of the wall and the window combined. And when you look at going above code to passive house levels of insulation, you can see it starts to open up the same effective results across more window options. So the same thing happens in the inverse. If you're using a window, you might be able to change your insulation levels. Um, so high performance in one area often lets you get away with a little lower performance than another. When you pull one lever, the other one moves in tandem. So how do you select these windows? How do you think about selecting these windows? Well, here is an example of a window uh, schedule template that we use at Source 2050 to capture all of the building science metrics for each unit, and then also ask those additional questions regarding manufacturer op options, because every manufacturer makes a different kind of window, maybe a different material, maybe a different operation, a different level of performance. And many of them have limitations on glass size, or they have specialties that they can offer that other manufacturers can't. So it's really important, go ahead and screen capture this, that when you're talking with manufacturers or you're talking with uh, providers, that you can ask those questions. Another great resource is from Green Building United again. They have a passive row house manual, which prompts designers to consider more than just the units as well with this great checklist that goes across not only size, function, and operation, but some of the aesthetic considerations, uh, some of the insulation considerations, accessories, shading, and things like that. So I'm going to hand it off to Ilka to start talking about operations. Yeah, so this is this is actually a great image or images from the Passive House, uh, the, the Row House manual that Shanna just mentioned. And I think Shanna is actually the one who generated these. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so what we want to look at is the before we go into what does high performance actually mean in a window, we just want to look at the uh, operation of the windows because we we all grew up in you know houses with with windows that operate in different ways. I actually grew up in Germany and Tilgen turn is all I knew until I moved here. I had never seen a double hung window or a casement. But um, you know, here that's that's more of the common operation that you see. So in the beginning, when we thought about high performance windows or passive house windows, when passive house started, it basically meant we had to import these tilt and turn windows from Europe. And that's why pre predominantly that's that's what we think of when we think about high performance windows or passive house windows are these tilt and turn windows. And they are super high performing. Um, they're very, very airtight, but because there's a market demand, because people here are used to other operations, there are actually other windows um, available now through um, as well that basically uh, operate in different ways. So you can find by now, uh, passive house casement window, as well as sliding windows, hoppers, and awnings. The one thing you can't really find is a single hung or double hung passive house window, because it's basically impossible to get those airtight. So, but what you can do is find a simulated double hung window 
which basically is looks like a uh, double hung window, but is actually a tilt and turn or a casement window. So uh, next slide, Shen. And that is uh, similar to the basically the uh, operation of the gliding doors that we're used to here in the States compared to a, um, a lift and slide door that comes or has been coming from Europe. The operation is slightly different where the lift and slide, you basically lift one of the doors up that makes you, um, you're able to, to slide that door and then you push it back down and that basically seals uh, the door and makes it airtight. Next slide. So the uh, anatomy of a high performance window. I think most of us are, are familiar with what that means. We're talking mostly, and again, this, this is a little um, graphic out of that row house, house uh, manual, but we're mostly talking about uh, triple glazing, but it depends on your climate. In some climates, uh, double glazed is okay as well. Uh, we're talking about uh, insulating gases between glass layers. Um, we are talking about an insulated frame. And this frame can come in different uh, materials, wood, fiberglass, aluminum, UPVC or PVC. Uh, a lot of times we have exterior cladding attached to it. But what's really important here and what's, what's different to regular or you know, more mainstream windows is that we're really looking at an airtight gasket within that frame and also a warm edge spacer between the glass layers. Next. So let's look at a non-passive house window. So this is actually a uh, Anderson A series. So it's, it's already a pretty good window um, and it's a double hung window. So what we can see is the obvious, you know, it's not triple glazed, it's double glazed, and there's no insulation in the frame, um, which, you know, you can see there might be, or most likely there's gonna be th some thermal bridging, especially in, in colder climate, and there's not much of air sealing addressed here. Uh, but what we can see though too is that those windows have a nailing flange and they also have integrated ex exterior jams and um, a sill. So this means that it makes it really, really easy to install and uh, the builder or the window installer most likely doesn't need much of, um, of experience to install those windows. But it, what it also means is that it's very defined where this window has to sit within the wall. Because basically your only way to install these windows is to screw them to the exterior she uh, sheathing and that's where they sit. So the other thing that uh, I wanted to look at is the, the data that we get with those types of windows. So what we can see, and this is also from the um, Anderson, um, manual or you know data um, sheet is basically uh, we can get the u factor of the the entire window which in this case it was kind of around a point three then we do get the solar heat heating coefficient which means how much solar radiation actually comes through the window and we can see that's around uh, a point two seven point three and then there's visual transmittance. And then there's also a little, little um, uh, line if it's compliant with Energy Star or not. So if we look at the code, we can see where that window sits within you know, the code world. So if we look at the um, different climate zones, they all require something around a 0 0.3, 0 0.32, 0 0.4. So this window, uh, sits pretty well within that range. And then um, another place where we can kind of gauge the, the, the performance of the window is to look at the Energy Star um, list. And Anderson is saying, okay, our window, we comply with the North Central um, parameters of, of, the, of the Energy Star, but that is Energy Star version six. So what I, when I kind of, 
dug into this a little deeper, I saw that right now, I think everyone has to switch over to the 0.7 version. And now that window actually doesn't comply with Energy Star anymore. So it's it's kind of interesting how that, that shifts. But overall, what I want to uh, point out is that this data that we're looking at is data that refers to the whole window. So we're looking at a window at the glazing and the frame basically combined values for U factor and the solar heating coefficient. So what that means is that the um, NF NFRC, they're, they're rating these windows and they basically take one standard size. There's a ratio be between the glazing and the frame and that gets calculated together into a whole window U factor and solar heat gain coefficient. Um, and that's that's going to be a, uh, um, very, very important once you go through certification to see the difference to the data that's required to go through like a, a passive house certification process. Uh, next slide. So in this, um, in comparison, is a tilt and turn passive house window. We can see that it's triple glazed. There is insulation in the frame. There is um, this warm spacer that's pretty apparent in there. And here, what we want to see is what, what the data that really interests us is the glazing, the U value, and the solar heat gain coefficient. But also separate from the glazing data, the frame data, also the view, view value and the width of the frame. And then we also want to know what the spacer, the psi value is, which basically describes the, the heat loss, the, the linear heat loss around each of those windows. So if we compare just quickly the overall performance to the previous win window, up there on the left. So it is described in just an overall performance, the um, the whole window um, U value comes out to around 0.14, solar heat gain coefficient can be up to 0.36 and the visual tr transmittance around 0.5. So, but if we now look at the data that we actually get from the data, from this, this is a solar window, um, all the data that we get and also that we need to import into a WUFI model or a PHPP model, like an energy model, there is quite a bit more, more information there because we're looking at different data points for the glazing and the frame. So the glazing here up on, um, in that little, little um, red cube there is the, the G value, which is the solar heating coefficient is a 0.5. And then the, the U value for the glass is a 0 0.09. And then we also get data for the frame, which is the U value just for the frame. And then the frame width for each of the sides of those uh, of the frame and also a value for the spacer. So, um, and this is something that gets imported into the energy model and is a lot more accurate than the overall whole window uh, value that we get through, you know, other other window manufacturers. They are not geared towards passive house um, windows. And then on the lower side, that's basically how that compares to a uh, passive house view at these these different data points. Um, what I wanted to note is if you if you do go through certification. If you go through the energy model, these are all the this is all the data that you need. But then, um, if you go through FIA certification, there's another model that gets generated. It's a uh, it's a REM rate model, and that actually looks at the whole window uh, data. So you you really have to know both at the end. Uh, next slide. So, but then the other thing that we want to know about the window is how is it installed? Because that's that's important as well as, as Shannon already mentioned. So this is a really nice little graphic uh, from the Passive House Institute in Darm, Darm, Darmstadt. And they basically look at 
the, the same wall and the same window, but positioned in different ways within the wall. So the U value of the window stays the same, so 0.16, but then the Psi install value, which again is that linear um, heat loss through, um, you know, where the frame meets the, meets the wall changes dependent on where the window is located. So on the left side, the window is pushed all the way out, which results in a poor Psi install of 0.007. Um, and then there is uh, the, the better version, the windows pushed a little bit further towards the inside of the, of the building and um, it's, it's uh, over insulated, which is important because you can see that that actually makes quite a bit of a difference, that over insulation. And then to the right, that's a really good window install where the window basically sits in the middle of the wall and is over insulated. So um, yeah, so keep that in mind moving forward. The next slide. So, but before you really can decide where the window is actually located in your wall, you also have to know the, your wall pretty well. So, um, what are the layers of the wall and how, get, how does it get built, for example? So, this is uh, an example that I wanted to share that this wall is something that we get prefabricated quite a bit. It's, it's optimized for prefabrication. So the layers are, um, are applied in a, in a certain sequence. And the, the assembly, just to go through it really quickly, uh, we have a surface cavity on the inside, the, the, um, their structural sheathing, which is also the air barrier and vapor retarder on the inside, a two by, four, uh, two by wall that's filled with, with insulation, and then exterior insulation, which is a wood fiber board. So um, next slide. So what does what this means uh, in case in this case where this wall gets fabricated in the factory is that uh, the sheathing is on the the uh, framing gets laid out, the sheathing gets put on, uh, insulation gets filled into the cavity, and then the the wood fiber board gets. Um, installed on top of that windows get cut get cut out and then then the the wall gets tilted up next slide um and then the window gets installed or can uh the wall gets um prepared for the window to be installed and this is a view from the inside from the outside there is a wrb applied on the outside of the wood fiber insulation next slide and then the rough opening of the window gets prepped. So the WRB, in this case, a, um, a uh, um, adhered membrane gets wrapped into the, the rough opening. Um, and you know all the air barriers from the inside, since the zip sheathing on the inside is the air barrier, that also needs to get taped into the rough opening. So all the air barriers get connected so that the window can get received. And what's really nice to see here on the left side is that there is a little bit of the wood fiber insulation that comes into the rough opening. So that means that this, this window is gonna be um, over insulated. And this wood fiber insulation is also a ni really nice positive stop for the window to be put in. Uh, next slide. But what that means is, for example, this rules out any kind of, uh, um, window with a nailing flange, for example, because the exterior insulation gets put on before the window gets installed. So I think that's what I wanted to make sure that um, everyone understands that there's a lot of uh, sequencing that happens even through um, making a wall and installing the window. And that all has to be considered in the, the, the way you can install the window and um, which window spec can be used. Uh, this is a, a, a detail basically of the window install that we saw on these pictures. On the pictures, we saw everything being installed by the, the manufacturer, but it can also, uh, the, win the, the walls can be fabricated in a factory and then the windows can be installed on site. 
So, and here, what's important is to figure out who does the taping, right? Who, which scope falls on the manufacturer and which scope falls on the, on the builder. So we have this little detail here that basically lays out, okay, our, our air barrier wraps into the rough, rough opening and that's still, um, still, you know, on the on the scope of the manufacturer. But then the panel gets delivered, and then all the taping after that, the taping of the pan flashing and um, connecting that to the window is going to be on the builder. So those those are all things that need to be considered. And there are a lot of different ways to install. Uh, these windows, um, but what's important is to really, really think through the the taping and the the air barrier connection all the way through. Next slide. And this is just another example of a different wall where we don't have the structure sheathing on the side, on the outside, on the inside, but on the outside. And uh, what we want to show here is that just the air barrier runs in a different way, but still has to connect through taping to the window. And again, this, this can be a, a wall that can be pre-manufactured, but in that case, the whole scope definition has to be clear again. And, uh, but it's also a very common wall to get installed or um, built on site. And then all the, the taping and the install is gonna be on the builder. Next. Thanks, Elka. Those were great. And I loved your quote of before you can determine your window install installation strategy, you have to know your wall pretty well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit too about masonry retrofits because there are so many of those. And so many of us understand that the window is the weakest part of the wall that we can actually get to easily and fix when we're already in an existing building. So knowing that wall too is very, very important. And what I'm showing here is from Passive House Accelerator, you can go into the website and do a search for retrofits or masonry retrofits, and it will yield a whole bunch of results. And there are even magazines completely devoted to it um, on the accelerator. So don't uh, waste that great resource. So this example on this slide is from a cooperative retrofit that Jane Sanders did and did a presentation on uh, with her firm, Henson Architecture. And what they did was very similar to some of the strategies Ilka mentioned. And first and foremost, the wall, they insulated on the interior. Sometimes when we do a retrofit, we install insulation on the exterior. But with this one, they chose the interior because they had a very historic facade and the client wanted to keep it. So knowing that they're insulating on the interior, they also have a service cavity and they have their drywall that comes returning to the window or their trim. And what is important is to see the existing masonry right here and right here and how that thermal bridge from the exterior doesn't end at the brick. It ends at the extent of the masonry. So when we insulate on the interior, we really need to continue that insulation right here where there's a thermal break material, at the window buck where there's thermal break material, and even if we can over insulate that frame like it shows right here at the head. And then at the sill, same idea. Insulation comes up the wall and travels over on top of that masonry to mitigate that thermal bridge and goes underneath the window unit itself, creating a little bit of a buck there. And then over insulation again at the frame on the exterior. So what we've done is we've created continuous insulation all the way along this path, which is that really fundamental principle. And then the air barrier is shown inside the warm edge of the insulation on the interior of the service cavity where it really can't get penetrated. And it comes up and is taped right to the window because the window then becomes that insulation airtight layer in the opening and then tapes again and continues to the wall. 
So it continues the air barrier and it continues the insulation layer. You can see these great images they showed of how they did that insulation and how they taped and, and did mock-ups as they went to understand that wall. So if you have a retrofit, open up the wall, do some what we call probes, check out the quality of your brick, see if you've got a window pocket in there that you can use um, or what else might exist. You never know when you open up an existing wall, right? Here is another great example from the accelerator for Six and Kane, which is the first Enerfit commercial um, building in the US and it's in Pennsylvania, done by Mosher Studio and also um, our friend Norm Horn, who was in this presentation at New Ecology. They also insulated an existing masonry building, but they did it on the exterior in some areas. And their insulation layer exists so far out that they could push the window out into that area and their thermal buck really extends the window past where you would normally install it, which is right in here. And it gave them the ability to continue that insulation and airtight layer outside of all of that masonry, which prevents it from being a thermal break for the full extent of the wall, because now it's on the interior. And you can see that they do extend the insulation under the sill, over the head, and continue it down over the frame a little bit as well. And if you haven't seen this presentation, the installation sequencing and some of the comments they make in the live video there are phenomenal because they talk about when you do put these items together in an existing wall, they get really dusty. And you have to clean them in order for that tape to adhere well and for that airtight layer to really uh, be continued and not interrupted or uh, lose its adhesion. And then this last example is also, uh, it says exterior insulation. Please forgive me, it is interior insulation. <laughs> um, but this is from the Passive Row House Manual. And the window strategy here is to create that thermal break by making a sill out of the insulation material and cladding over it. And also continuing that through to the interior insulation, having a service cavity with that insulation inside of that and making sure it's vapor open. Um, they had tested their brick in this situation and knew that insulating to the interior could create a freeze thaw situation that could harm the brick. And so they worked very hard on the window and that installation detail to make sure that that brick would survive the upgrade. Um, the other thing that they did, which I found really interesting in this strategy, was they did what's called battering the interior wall, which is creating this chamfered edge or this angled splayed edge at the corner. Because what that does is it allows more light to enter the space. Sometimes when we extend our windows out and we fatten up our walls, we lose a little bit of visible light or we you know, uh, just create a, a very deep window where we can't appreciate visually the window itself, which often is really beautiful. And um, this is a great solution for that. Last thing I wanted to talk about is when you're optimizing your window and you're looking at your wall, you're looking at your installation strategy, and you're looking at the unit itself, and you're trying to figure out what are the metrics I need my window to satisfy for my energy model? How do I optimize this? In, uh, in FIA certification, which is how I typically certify, we have a prescriptive path and we have a performance path. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about those with regard to the windows. Because when you use a prescriptive path, it gives you this kind of climate-based performance target right off the bat by using that prescriptive calculator and getting your performance targets immediately based on where you're located, what climate you're in. And then it even gives you a prescription for the maximum window U value and the maximum solar heat gain coefficient that you want for that window. And what we're looking at when we do prescriptive 
for the window and the whole building as a system is we're making it a little bit more conservative because instead of having to do an energy model, because when you do the prescriptive path and it's single family only this path, there are a couple differences between the performance path and the prescriptive path. The first and most obvious being that no energy model is required. So it's a little bit more conservative to make sure that if there's wiggle room there, um, we're erring on the side of safety. We're erring on the side of more efficiency. And so we take into account that climate zone specific solar heat gain coefficient, where those windows are, how they're oriented, and the area of those. Those are limited in size. And then the overhangs are also more prescriptive, what you have to do in terms of shading. And if you are looking at the fenestration U values or the moisture risk, those are also more specific to your location. So you can go on the FIAS website and look at the checklist that they have. It's hot linked and learn your upfront requirements for coordination and iteration for the design and realize you don't need that special energy modeling training required as long as you follow all of the items in the checklist. And that review process is typically shorter and more straightforward. But you can see these four items on the bottom here are straight off of that checklist and are uh, applicable to the window. So the solar heat gain coefficient requirement applies to the whole window, not just the center of the glass. So that's a difference when you model it, you can use the center of the glass. When you do a prescriptive path, you have to use that whole window. And the U-value requirement applies to not only the whole window, but also the whole door if you're doing doors. And then the sum of the area divided by the sum of the window area and the opaque area uh, are combined so that you really have an understanding of how they're working as a system. And that's where that um, conservative approach really ensures that when you're doing the prescriptive path, that you're erring on the side of safety. And then the same applies for skylights. So you're looking at not only the skylight alone or the wall alone, but how they're working in tandem. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're going to switch over to some live energy modeling, which is that special surprise that uh, Jose was talking about, because Olga is gonna open up the energy model and show you how to optimize if you're doing the performance path. How you doing, Elka? Are you are you good to share your screen? I think you're muted, so you, I'm not sure if you're ready to answer. And while she's doing that, please put your questions in the chat. We are we are available until the very end of today, and even that overtime uh, to answer all of your questions. So please do put those in the chat. Okay, I'm unmuted, right? Yep. Uh, so yeah, what I wanted to talk about is this um, actual energy modeling piece, because if you go, if you don't go through the path that uh, Shannon just explained, you have to have an energy model if you go to, through the perform performance uh, path. So, and I think either way, I mean, I'm, I'm a big energy modeler. I, I think there's, a, there's so much value in doing that. Um, if, if, if that's available to you, because it just tells you so much about the build your specific building, but it also really, really, um, you, you learn so much by doing this. And of course, every building that your energy model is different, but overall, you just get to understand all the parameters that impact your building in different ways. So what I wanted to show here is basically this is a this is a Wolfie model. So FIAS uses this for energy modeling. Um, PHI uses PHPP, which is basically the same same thing, the same information gets computed. It's just a different interface. So what what Wolfie shows you, and I don't know if, um, how much everyone is um, used to to seeing this <laughs> but basically what Wolfie does is it, it gives you a little little graphic of your building and then uh, a, a little tree where uh, it 
this displays all your components that describe your geometry and then their inputs for for systems and all kinds of things but we we wanted to um to focus on the envelope specifically the the windows today so this is what i'm going to show you so the and and this basically goes back to that information that you need about the window in order to actually input these into the uh, the energy model. So what I wanted to show here is basically, uh, this is a project that has a lot of really big windows here and a lot of shading around it. So what the first thing we did is basically uh, look at all the, the trees around this building. We actually did a little drone um, drone analysis to measure the height of the, the, the trees, like in wireframe, that's that's basically representing the trees, uh, to gauge how much shading there's going to be on the windows. And shading is something that we really need to talk about too, because that's super, super uh, important as well when you talk about windows. But basically, that's the first step, how much, uh, how much sun actually hits those windows and what are the windows so basically this is um, a model where we look at all these different kinds of windows that we have to group in different ways so these are the tilt and turns these are the fixed windows then we have a glazed entry doors um, we have windows uh, that are lift and slides or doors that are lift and slides we have the opposite where the panel doesn't slide. And then we have windows that have mullions in it. So we have to divide all of those out because they all do have different para parameters. So if, if we look at this um, window, the tilt and turns, for example, we see an overall U value for the window here. But if you go into, um, uh, oh, sorry into the information that is needed is basically exactly what we looked at before. So we have the glass U value, we have the frame U value here, we have the frame width for left, right, top and bottom, and then there's a glazing to psi value, uh, glazing to frame psi value, and there's also a frame to wall psi value. So all those those uh, data points that we mentioned before actually go into this model, and um, and that's different for for every one of those windows. So if you go through certification, you basically need a data sheet for for every single window that you're looking at. So um, the one thing that I wanted to mention about energy modeling is. It's a little hard, like you see, this is, these are the results down here, and we're really happy because we have all green check marks. That's what we want to see. But, uh, and it, it tells you how much heating demand, cooling demand, uh, heating load, cooling load, source energy, and site energy there is. So what it doesn't really tell you is how that applies to that corner here or that big room that has a lot of glazing there. It doesn't tell you if that room is overheating or not. We, in reality, because this is actually being built, know if we don't have cooling there, it's going to be overheating. But Woofie doesn't really tell us that because what Woofie does is see this whole box as one value with one temperature that that's distributed all over the all over the place. So that's something just to keep in mind when uh, when you do an energy model that it's 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 a great great tool but you can only trust it to a certain degree what you need is to work with an MEP or with with um, a system designer who does load calculations per room because they actually look at that run room here in the corner and they see all the glazing and they can actually tell you what the loads are that the system needs to um, make up for all that solar gain that's happening here right now. So the next thing I wanted to show is basically, um, I, I set up this, this second case and what I did is I basically um, grouped all the windows together. So I'm just in, just because it's easier to show the impact, I just grouped all the windows together and I'm just saying, okay, they're all tilt and turn windows for now. So what I can 
show you now is to um, basically say, remember that code window or just slightly above code window that we looked at before? What does it do if we replace our, our super high performing Enersign window here with a code window? And this is what happens. So the heating demand goes up like three times just by um, just by replacing the window specs here. And that's what Shannon was saying before, you know, there are all these different layer le levers and you change one and it affects the whole, uh, the whole puzzle basically. So if we go back to the, um, to the tilt and turn that we had picked before and look at the solar heating coefficient, for example. That's something that's really, really important when you pick your window because it really affects how, you know, how your 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 whole building performs in terms of um, heating demand, but also looking at cooling and what it does to your systems. So if I change right now, we have uh, a solar heating coefficient of a 0.353 uh, middle of glass. If I change that to a lower solar heating coefficient, which is 0.3, you can see what it does to the overall energy um, you know, balance here. So, I mean, that's a pretty big step from a 0.5 to 0.3. But again, I just want to make sure, you know, I, I just make, you know, show these extremes. So the heating demand goes up. Oh, sorry. This is actually not doing what I what it's supposed to do. Hmm. Woofie has a way of doing that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> No, actually, it, it's it's right. Sorry, um, I was looking for the little button here that sometimes shows up, but it did do the right thing. So what it does, because we have less solar uh, gains, our heating demand goes up quite a bit. So that's something that then we have to counteract with more insulation at the end, or you know the system needs to to needs to make up for it. So. Um, yeah, that's something that I wanted to show here as one one parameter, one lever, like what Shannon was talking about overall, that also happens on this really minuscule level within a window that if you change one little thing, it changes um, the rest of, uh, you know, what what you have to account for as well. So in this, in this um, case, I wanted to show really quickly how we talked about the install of the window and where it sits within the wall and we talked about okay this is um, more or less a uh, ideal window placement in the middle of the wall but it's 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 kind of different a little bit like you have to look at look at it as a system again so what happens is if you um look at where the window is placed within the wind uh, within the wall and that 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 gets described by this little button here by the depth of reveal window reveal and by the distance from the edge of glazing to reveal so if i place the window a little bit closer towards the outside of the facade let's say i'll just put a one here you can see how that changed where the window is located you see how much impact that has right so if we place that to 12 it goes in it changes and I, I don't want to go into each of the numbers and what exactly it means but I just wanted to show how much of an impact these little moves actually have within those um the, the placement of where the window goes. And that also uh, accounts for the distance from the edge of the glazing to the reveal, which basically means this is this is the reveal and it, it shades the glazing of the window. So in this case, we basically over insulated the frame and we basically, um, it's almost that there's only glazing 
visible from the outside. So we have a really, really small distance between the edge of um, the reveal to the glazing. So if we change that, if we say, okay, we don't over insulate the frame, which actually gives us a better psi install value. But if we don't do that and we say, okay, there is um, four inches of distance there, you know, it gives us quite a bit more um, solar heat gain through the windows because it's not shaded as much by that reveal. So there's a lot of uh, little, little, little intricacies there. And I think uh, what I want to say is it's, it's not necessarily one size fits all, but it's really nice to be able to just kind of have those, those little, little levers and being able to play around with that and find the optimal placement and the optimal window for the specific project. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Elka. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like a lot of questions came into the chat and everyone was chatting it up a lot. And uh, one of the things, well, we there's a lot we didn't cover, right? There's a lot we did cover and a lot we didn't cover. But one of the funniest things over the years that we've seen are these elaborate spreadsheets that architects create to compare windows. Because as Elka showed you in that energy model, you need all the metrics for every unit you're going to use so that you can input it into the energy model and do that optimization. So when you're searching for windows, you're reaching out to manufacturers, you're gathering all this information, you're putting it into spreadsheets. And I think we should have a spreadsheet competition to see which architect out there has compared the most windows for the most metrics and the most uh, pricing <laughs> differential. So Zach, a new, a new uh, competition. It's a throwdown. Perfect. Throw down. <laughs> Perfect. And I just want to give a quick hi. I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you, too, to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxed Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaire, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Bewiso, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Brennan Brennan, Coltraco Ultrasonics, Euroline Windows, Holstrom System, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T Stud. Thank you, sponsors. And I just want to give a quick shout out to our newest patron sponsor as well, Longboard Architectural Products. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Uh, thank you to all the sponsors. Thanks for everyone that makes this happen, uh, makes this possible for us to share all the knowledge. So, yeah, a lot of good questions. And the first one is really a great question just to get it started. Uh, it's from uh, Jessica Lirendahl, and if she's on the call, she could uh, unmute and ask a question, or I can read it. Hi, it's Jessica Lee Randall, and um, I have two projects in Staten Island, New York, that I'm hoping to retrofit. One is a two-family home, and the other is a single-family home. Um, and I wanted to know if I could begin a retrofit by replacing doors and windows with passive um, certified products. Thank you. Great question, Jessica. I'm sure Ilka and I will both have plenty of opinions to share on this one. The short answer, as I said in the chat, is yes. You can start with just the windows or just the windows and doors. But the long answer is, Going back to what Ilka mentioned, which is really understanding your wall, because if your wall is uh, of poorer quality and you're going to retrofit that as well, and you know you're going to retrofit that as well, you want to do the two in tandem, because that overall effective U value of the two working together is uh, important to understand before you choose your window. 
Um, another option for you if you have issues with these retrofits where maybe you have tenants that you can't move out is there are units now where you can put an insert inside of an existing window and bring it up to almost passive house levels of performance, if not passive house levels of performance, without doing any demo. Um, that does not help your effective R value or your wall at all, but it's a very fast fix. So, uh, Elka, do you wanna? Speak yeah, I just want to question. Yeah, really quickly, um, it's it's definitely the right way to go around, you know, um, improving the windows first. If if you have to stagger it like that, and then the walls, uh, it's not so great to do it the other way around, where you really improve the the walls and for some reason not the windows, because what happens is if you if you improve the walls and the air tightness and everything, the the difference between the windows and the, the rest of the envelope becomes too great. And you look into uh, condensation um, problems on the windows if they're really low performing. I'm glad you said that. I'm uh, surprised I left that out. <laughs> it's huge, huge. When, when people replace windows, they often end up with condensation problems because they haven't thought that through. Yeah, no, thank you for those answers. Uh, yeah, really important to put everything together and think about it as a whole, not rather, not just uh, change one piece and hope that that makes the all difference, right? Um, so our next question is from Harvey Minnick. Harvey, are you on the call? I am here. Shannon, it's not the typical Harvey question today. So I'm going to try something a little bit, a little bit out of uh, that I'm not comfortable with, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Great. First of all, just great presentation. I really, really enjoyed it because this is something that really um, is an area I think that pr maybe a lot of tradespeople who are certified pass trades tradespeople always have a problem with. So here's my question. I'll sort of rephrase it from where I put it in the, in the chat box. Why isn't there a standard? You guys did a great job of better, best, and 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 good. But why isn't there a standard? Like, are, are do each individual window, passive house window manufacturers have a different methodology of how they think it should be installed? And then why are we not looking at this being as a best practice? Because you guys did a fabulous job, but shouldn't it just be something that's, although I'm going to use the word maybe incorrectly, but I think it's the right word, is why isn't this prescriptive? Why isn't it that no matter what you have retrofit, or if it's a brand new build and we're going for we're going for either FIAS or passive house certification, why don't we have best practices and why don't we say, here's what it should be for all manufacturers of all doors and all windows, and we push it back on them in case that is the in case that is the issue. I know that you there's different ways of tying in, but why isn't there something that's really, really standardized that makes it so simple that you have, you know, the passive row house manual, why don't we have the passive row house? doors and window install manual for air barriers and vapor control airs. That's my question today. Okay, do you want to take a stab at that first? Uh, yeah, I can I can take a stab. And thanks, Harvey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. No, I, I think it's a really, really good point. And I think we tried to just give a little bit of an overview, but you're right, there's so many different uh, ways to do this that you basically have to go online and you know just kind of comb your your way through it i think the reason though is th that there is not one way to do it is as we said it, it depends on the wall for example where the window is placed and that depends on the climate and that that depends on on the builder who has a lot of different ways of uh, you know resourcing materials for air tightness. Some builders prefer membranes, some builders prefer liquid applied, some builders, I mean, now you can get a, um, a flanged window, I think, it, or at least some clip system for a passive house window. I think uh, just as many, pref as many builders are out there and as many products as, are out there, as many ways to, you know, go about it is there. I mean, it's kind of the, the problem, right? It's it's a good or bad thing. I mean, that's I think what I was trying to say in the beginning with the two different windows, like a, a traditional window that's flanged, that's where the window goes, right? Everyone knows how to screw this onto the sheathing, 
tape it off and that's what it is. But in that case, you don't really have the option to over insulate or to to change the reveal or you know do all these different things that maybe architecturally you would want to do or performance wise that works better on that side of the building or in that climate so yeah i don't know shannon do you have a better answer <laughs> uh, i think the availability of materials and the availability of units is so specific to uh location and then the climate and the design are so specific to location that uh, it really is hard to standardize this. Um, but I think it could be done by location and, and it could be done small, medium and large, right? And and to the perfect Harvey question at a small, medium and large cost, maybe. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> and, I, and I think maybe one thing to add is maybe you can find your standard install I think that's that's maybe on on each builder or architect who basically decides, OK, this is what works best for me. And that's what we do from now mm -hmm. on. That's my standard. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah, yeah thank you for <laughs> <laughs> no rebuttal. OK, I, I just I, I agree. I agree. But I think that the issue comes in that there is sort of. If you look at it as a bell curve and you look at it location, I don't disagree with that. You would be able then to have a chart almost and say, okay, you're in this location. Here's what your wall looks like. Here's the best practice that we have. Go do your own thing, but here's something. Because everything that we're doing obviously goes back into the model. And there's there's not a lot of fudging around with the model. If you're, either it's the FIAS model or the WIPI model or the PHPP. That's what really what I was trying to get to. But it's sure. a very... It, it is a very, it's a broad, it's very broad. I get that. I'm just looking at, like, I, I always think of, okay, here's your wall. Here's where the air barrier goes. Here's what it's yep. standardized. Here's where we can make the change. Here's the best practice. We've seen it before. Oh, we can add this, this, this depending if you have time to do this or you don't have time. You're using zip. You're not using zip. All you know, Harvey, things, I'm going to interrupt you just for a sec, because I think that if we look to the folks who are doing what you're asking for, We'll see examples like what Ilka is doing, what Emu uh, Passive is doing with their pilot homes, and what the prescriptive method is trying to do. You know, they may not get into that install piece, like put it together this way, but some of them do. So um, hopefully, we'll make it easier for everybody. Yeah, let, let, let me interject here also, just as a as a general note, as someone that has worked with Windows and installation, yeah, I mean, there's there's no one size fits all, unfortunately, but you can definitely apply the basic principles, which is, you know, try to stay along the lines of the insulation, try to have at least one side vapor open to prevent condensation, and uh, yeah, just work with the builder and the designer at the beginning of the project to try to figure out what works best or gives you more flexibility. I think those are, I mean, in my experience, those those have been the three important things to keep in mind because they will always change and this will it's always going to be different depending on the window profile even so this is a conversation for an hour for sure um so yeah we have until 115 kim are we staying for a little longer for one more question uh yeah it looks like we have about four minutes left and next on the list i had um iphone I don't know who that is. But uh, yeah, you, the iPhone. Are you here? I was, was going to ask who, who's iPhone. Uh, insulating on inside. Insulating on inside was a woofy analysis consider. So I guess insulation on the inside. Yeah, I guess we'll leave that person to clarify their question if, if anyone recognizes it. Or we can jump to the next one if that one's not clear, given that we've only yeah. got a couple minutes. Uh, yeah, so, well, there was a question about the skylights, if it's possible to use uh, to use them in a passive house, which was answered in the chat, but if you want to add something to it, just a general rule, uh, it's, I guess, it's, I guess, good to know. Hi, uh, that was my question about roof lights. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, go ahead. And I do know you can get flat roof skylights, but I mean inline sloped roof lights. Uh, and I've just found in my horror that um, they are, are available in Passive House Center, but they're not available in the U.S. Um, does anyone know? Uh, somebody said Lamilux, but that's 
Velux also do flat roof, but I want slope roof. Does anyone know of any? Lamalux does create a, a sloped and a flat version. And, um, you know, we really do need more options there. So mm -hmm. I appreciate asking that question because I think I only know of two certified units and only one of which is readily available. And that's that Lamalux unit. Uh, Sean is just saying FACRO, which is what we yeah. use. Uh yeah, Fracro is great. Sorry, yeah. It's daylight saving has gone off here, so we have an hour <laughs> behind um, our head. Um, uh, so, um, you think I could ask Lamalux and um, Fracro, and what was and what was the other thing? I'm sorry that you said. Fracro is the other one I was thinking of. Um, yeah. But I also mentioned you can put another unit in, and take a performance hit on your effective. Uh, our value and see if your energy model can take that hit yeah, and still yeah. certify, right? Yeah. So you're pulling a lever and saying, hey, I need to use this other skylight because I either can't afford the unit I want or I yeah, can't get the unit I want in or the lead time is too long. It's back ordered and I'm in a rush. So uh, sometimes you just use your right. energy model to do the best you can and see yeah. if you can still hit your targets. Thank you very much, Fakro and Lamalux. I'll check those. Bye. Yeah. Can I can I add real quickly, Shannon? You're totally right, and that's possible. But you definitely have to see if the um, there's a calculator for condensation risk and yes. for comfort. Uh, so that window, even if it's not like the super highest R value, still you have to make sure that there's no condensation risk and it doesn't impact your comfort within the house. And there's a calculator for that. That's for everything. <laughs> yeah, put the numbers in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, up next, we have uh, T. Sandberg. The, the question was about uh, entry doors appropriate for passive house certification. In case there's any information Shannon or Ilka would like to share there. Uh, it's uh, the second to last question, so there's only one more after this one. Did you get that, Elka? I didn't quite understand the question. Just uh, what's, oh, what's uh, available? Sorry. It's just, um, uh, well, it says considerations for choosing entry doors appropriate for passive house certification. Oh, great question. Entry doors are really, really hard. Um, if your entry door goes to the exterior and it's of the right size and type, there are more options to choose from. But if you're doing a commercial building where you have fire code issues or accessibility issues, your options for certified units go down very, very quickly. And you have to have, often have to really watch your condensation risk and your performance on those. Um, but anyone doing multifamily affordable totally gets that. Um, and then there was something else I was going to add, but Ilka, why don't you take it? I'm sure you've got yeah, just that exterior doors are tricky. There's still not as much availability as um, there is options for windows, definitely. So we we struggle with that a lot. And sometimes we actually go with a um, basically a glazed window, but replace the glazing with solid a solid core. So that we've done that. Um, but overall. I think what Shannon said before about windows that you could actually take an energy hit is the same for, for doors. I mean, the big thing is that it needs to be airtight, right? So uh, you have to make sure that there's enough airtight uh, conservation into the door, in the door that you're choosing. And then again, there's a condensation risk um, calculator even for doors. And if you're doing it, I remember what I was going to say, if you're doing a door between the house and the garage, because you've left the garage out of the thermal envelope, you can use a solid wood door. It gives you yeah. that two hour fire rating. You use an airtight weather stripping around it and you can hit your targets with a door like that. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Oka. Really uh, thanks, loved yeah. having everybody here. And please reach out to us after today if you had a question that we didn't get to. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in the next one. Have a good day.